The Village Square, a nervy bunch of liberals and conservatives who believe that disagreement and dialogue make for a good conversation, a good country, and a good time. At The Village Square, we believe big things can happen when ideas collide inside the bonds of mutual respect. We're building the town hall of the 21st century across the partisan divide. At The Village Square, we talk about politics, religion, and race. You know, the topics your mom taught you never to discuss in polite company. When most separate, we gather across color, creed, and ideology. Listen, at the Village Square, we make pigs fly. Welcome to the Village Square cast. This is your host, Vanessa Rouse. Thank you for joining us for The Righteous Mind Q&A with Dr. Jonathan Haidt. This is a continuation of our previous episode where social psychologist Dr. Haidt, or John as we often call him, shared the principles from his book, The Righteous Mind, Why Good People Are Divided by Politics and Religion. It's a fantastic talk. And by the way, this is a throwback episode, and I think you'll be surprised how relevant this talk is today. Last week, I sat down with Liz Joyner, Village Square's Executive Director, to chat about exactly that and to get an update on John's work. Our previous episode begins with the update from Liz, and we're going to share a little more of our chat to begin this episode too. And spoiler alert, we also give Liz the last word at the end because she does an excellent job of bringing us full circle to the role we all can play in using our differences to our advantage rather than to divide us further. One of my favorite things about this episode is that we get to hear reflections from audience members. And so to kick things off, I decided to start with part of last week's chat with Liz, where we shared some of our own reflections from the program. And I think we need this now, maybe perhaps more than ever. I certainly have found his words to be very helpful. I actually started reading the book and I've got a funny story for you really fast on that. So probably a few, couple few years ago, you know, at a time when I was particularly frustrated just about the division and kind of where do we go from here and really trying to understand different viewpoints. Um, My mom handed me a book and it was The Righteous Mind. (laughs) She handed it to me, you know, as mothers do when they know that you need something. And it's been sitting on my night table because I generally listen to audiobooks these days. So do I. And just hadn't got around to it yet. And working with the Village Square, I decided I need to get this on Audible, went ahead and downloaded it. And then I we had that first interview about the Village Square 101 and you brought it up and I was thinking, where have I heard this name before? Where have I heard this name <laughs> oh, before? <that's> <laughs> and I went back after the interview and looked and I'm like, this is the book I've been trying to read. All roads lead to Jonathan Haidt. <laughs> exactly. I mean, I could not believe the coincidence and now for me, you know, more relevant than ever. And, and um, so anyway, I started the book this week and also have now listened to the discussion that we're about to play for the audience here. It's amazing how relevant it still is today. Um, And like I said, you know, possibly even more needed now. But even in the little bit that I've listened to so far of the book, it really already has backed me down from this place of, you know, what's happening here to, oh, okay, kind of seeing Number one, understanding people a little bit better, but also seeing the big picture of just the the good parts of our, you know, we have sometimes we have these frustrating characteristics that, that make it feel like, why is this getting in the way of us getting along? But then when he really talks about why we are the way that we are and how important that is to our society as a whole, it really helps you kind of back down from this stand that we take against, you know, when we don't get uh, the the bigger picture. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. It's like you're, you enlarge your frame of reference and all of a sudden you see it from a different angle. And, you know, in some ways that's the essence of both the Village Square and the idea behind John's work is that that, that we really actually, the way the humans reason, um, which is intuitively rather than rationally, and as parts of groups, we, we reason as a part of a group that we're, it's kind of a team sport. 
and incompletely using confirmation bias. So we, we very often believe what we want to believe. And because of those characteristics of how we make decisions, we actually need people who see it very differently than we do to be able to complete our understanding of all the sort of the different aspects of our challenges and our problems. And if you only do that reasoning with people who agree with you, you're going to have these gaping blind spots because you have similar blind spots. And also because of some of the characteristics of, of you know, teams and, and tribes, uh, quote unquote, and so we really do need each other. And when you start seeing it that way, it just, it, it just changes everything. It really does. Right. Absolutely. I, I loved how during the Q&A period, there was some talk about people's reactions to reading the book and how it made them, you know, like the, hate the other side a little bit less or allowed them to kind of understand family members. And I think this is one of the things that's happening right now is we're trying to figure out, we're trying to understand, we're trying to appreciate even in in the face of such different views on things. And I just think this book is so far of what I've read, it just is a remarkable way of having us kind of back, back down and understand people better. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And actually, one of the things that has been a really interesting walk for me is is I came to this work leaning left. And obviously, you know, I was one of the founders of the organization and so really believed in the importance of building bridges and relationships. But I have come to understand that as someone on the left, I do I do believe that we understand conservatives less than they understand us, and actually the you know, scientific data it, uh, stands behind that in John's uh, moral foundations theory, in that liberals are very focused on whether something is caring or fair, and if you watch politics on the left and start to understand it as growing out of a moral foundation that's focused on that, you begin to hear it over and over and over again. It is, uh, that's what we talk about, that's what we care about, and and that's how we measure uh, morality and policies. So, the, in the data shows that actually conservatives don't care less about whether something is caring or whether it's fair. It's just that they add a wider array, John call, likens them in the conversation that's going to air to taste buds. Uh, they have a wider array, array of things that they're weighing something against. So they also throw in uh, the mor morality of liberty, loyalty, authority, and sanctity. And John calls those the binding moral foundation. So those are about sort of how we group up together. And when you start to understand the differences between us through that lens, they start making a lot of sense. And you can, if you're, if you're liberal and tend to look at, at uh, ideas on the right as being morally wrong, but then look at those, those other foundations, liberty, loyalty, authority, and sanctity, you start to understand what it is they're talking about. And, and then all of a sudden, they don't seem mean or immoral, they just seem different. And, and I, 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 that has changed everything about how I understand the politics that we see every day. Well said. Yes. You know, I would have to say this before even just, I don't know, the two chapters that I've read of this book and the talk that we're about to listen to. I maybe would have thought differently about what you said, but it makes complete sense to me now. Just in, and it's remarkable. I think, you know, the change in perspective is just one of the most fascinating things to me and how it can be a relatively small amount of new information. And all of a sudden, you know, it, things seem clearer. So that really makes a lot of sense to me. And that's a wonderful thing about human beings, right? That we can change our perspectives. All right, let's get on with the program. As I mentioned earlier, we're picking up at the point where John's talk has just ended and the Q&A portion of the evening is just beginning. Two facilitators are welcome to the stage to moderate this part of the discussion. So here we are with Liz Joyner introducing the facilitators to the stage. 
Now I'd like to introduce our two facilitators for the evening. Dr. Steve Mills is Associate Director of the Center for Leadership and Social Change at FSU, where he oversees the center's community engagement efforts and teaches in the Undergraduate Leadership Certificate Program. Steve's master's degree is from University of Florida in counselor education, and his PhD is from Purdue University. He is extremely interested in ideas that help us understand ourselves and each other. Steve Seibert, he actually wrote this, and he says he's a lot of formers. I didn't actually say that. <laughs> a former county commissioner, a former state agency head, a law firm partner, adjunct law professor, century commission executive director, and senior vice president at the Collins Center for Public Policy. He currently, he's some currents as well, he currently sits on the board of directors of a Fortune 500 company. The Mosaic Company is a recognized mediator and facilitator and consults with both private and public sector clients on how to deal with challenges of conflict and change. And I should also mention that Steve Seibert leans right and Steve Mills leans left, and they're both on our board of directors, and they actually like each other. So you covered a lot of territory there, John. So I was, I've read your book a couple times, and I was still getting a little dizzy. So I'm, um, I've been so busy ferrying you around, I, I really have had a chance to tell you how much I appreciate your um, ideas and the way you choose to employ them. I mean, I'm not going to say I have a little man crush on you, but I mean, it's something like that. Um, <laughs> I think the thing that I appreciate the most about them is just their explanatory power, uh, like watching the Republican convention and watching the Democratic convention, Democratic convention, I, I just felt like I was seeing it as a human endeavor more than I had before. Um, like the, you know, I was still found myself impatient with the Republican convention, but I would, I would, you know, be thinking to myself, look at those folks, and they're pitching for our moral capital. You know, they understand that sanctity is going to build our moral capital. They understand the loyalty. They understand authority. So when I turned it off angrily, I wasn't mad at them as people. You know, I was just, I was just mad that. Well, I'm not sure exactly, but I, I was. So were you less mad than you would have been if you? I was commitment? much less mad than I would have been. I was appreci I was appreciative of the effort. Yeah, yeah. And watching the the, the um, Democrat convention, I felt that you know, I almost was more impatient with that convention than I would have been. I was like, look, you're just beating those same two drums over and over again. It's just harm and justice, harm and justice. You know, you, come on, let's let's talk about some, some, some more things. And so, um, and I know that's what you're going for. You know, that the, the purpose of your work is to, to humanize folks that have been previously demonized. And I wonder if you're hearing that that's working. You know, you've been touring. I'd just like to hear some of the things you've been hearing about. Uh, so I get a lot of uh, email the, the thing that's been most gratifying to me about the reception of the book is that uh, it has been very well reviewed on the right and the left. And when I, for the four years that I was writing the book, I was very aware on every page with every word how, how I had to thread this needle, how sensitive people are, and how if people get the sense that I'm out to get one side or the other, then the book's going to be written off. And I wanted a book that everybody was going to read, uh, not just because I wanted huge book sales, but because, you know, if this is going to work the left and right have to have at least some common vocabulary so that they can talk to each other. I was hoping that my book would provide a common vocabulary. What I'm finding is that the book is being read much more on the left. Uh, that's just the nature of uh, science trade books are bought overwhelmingly on the left. Uh, uh, conservatives don't buy nearly as much uh, science writing. Um, but it is being read by, by especially some intellectuals on the, on the right. Some, uh, a number of, uh, a lot of religious congregations are reading it and discussing book groups. I'm thrilled about that. And you know, my goal is not to bring everyone to the center. My goal is not that we should all agree. Disagreement is good. Disagreement is fine. None of us can see the whole story, so you need groups pushing against each other. That's fine. All I want is to tone it down from demonizing disagreement to productive disagreement. And people who read the book, I mean, I, I, you know, I can't do a survey, but, mm -hmm. the, but what people say to me is very much that, that it's, you know, it doesn't bring them to the center, but it makes them hate the other side less. And every time I hear that, I cheer. Like, yes, that's what I was. That's what I've been working for years to do. So, I, my sense is that your reaction is is fairly common. And yeah, I'm you thrilled were successful. About well, I'm I'm sort of dumbstruck by all of this. So, because I couldn't think of a question, I asked Neil on the way up, and I said, Neil Skeen, give me a good question to ask. And um, and he said he said, let's talk about rhetoric. The rhetoric is ugly. The rhetoric is demeaning. And is there a way to? I'm not satisfied that making us hate each other less is a good answer. I'm not satisfied that, from your book, I want to show that public policy might really be improved by drawing on insights from all sides. I don't know what that means. I'm not satisfied that eating together and drinking together is going to get us, is going to change the nature of the rhetoric. I, I, help us out here. Sure. Make it clearer how we can get over this hump. 
Okay, so um, uh, yeah, so the rhetoric is nasty, and once we shift over into the mindset of war, uh, then we're not going to take anything from the other side except for maybe you know prisoners and trophies by cutting their ears off or something like that. But uh, if morality binds and blinds, then each side is going to be blind. That you can't think straight. If you're high on morality, you can't think straight about complex policy issues. So let's just take global warming. So I I believe that the, the science is valid. Even if it was, and I'm totally open to the possibility that since most scientists are liberal, maybe they are deluded. But if it was a hoax or something, we would see more defections. We'd see more people moving away. We're not seeing that. We're seeing actually skeptics moving over more generally. So I think it's a real problem. Uh, and if you just let the left run everything on this, what are they going to do? They're going to use a lot of command and control methods um, that are going to cost an incredible amount of money that are going to uh, make economic production less efficient. And uh, on the right, what they're afraid of the re reason why they are, I believe, uh, often denying the science is because there is a long streak of anti-capitalism on the left. This goes back to the 18th century. Long streak of anti-industrialism. The left hates cars unless they're electric. Uh, the left hates factories. And so the right is afraid that the left is going to basically use this to, for control. And there's probably some truth to that. Um, I'm now in a business school and I am in awe of the incredible power of markets and well set up incentive systems to let people find innovative solutions. And the right is right about this. Libertarians are right about this. So if you agree that global warming is a problem, odds are, if you let your side in its moralistic fervor be in charge of solving it, they're not going to think straight. Um, in the car yesterday, Steve and I uh, came up with this uh, club, a club we're going to start called the, the Asteroids Club uh, for people who perceive these asteroids headed to Earth, like global warming is going to destroy us. No, the entitlement uh, binge is going to destroy us. Uh, you know, both sides see these asteroids headed, headed towards the Earth, and they're only concerned about their own asteroid. They don't see the one that the other guy sees behind them. Um, so I do think that we need to collaborate to solve these problems. It's funny you should say that because right during your speech, um, my wife Brenda leaned over to me and said, "We need aliens." <laughs> yeah. that's aliens. That's right. Yeah. Uh, the day that we are attacked by Martians, yes, we will come together. And probably the worst movie I've ever seen is called Independence Day, but it's about that. Right. Right. Yeah. And we do come together. So you liked it? Good special effects, but so schlocky. <laughs> Zulus throwing spears at the aliens, showing how we're all coming together in a diverse ways to fight. The oh, come on. <laughs> So, John, you didn't um, mention at all the elephant and the rider in your talk today, and, I, and I've, I've found that really very useful. I wonder if you could just mention that just really quickly. Sure. Yeah. Well, okay, well, as you opened by saying, I've covered a lot of ground, so for me I to know, throw in I'm yet sorry, more but, metaphors. But I think it, it, it works. Oh, thank you. Yeah. So, my, my first book, The Happiness Hypothesis, uh, developed the metaphor that the, our minds are divided like a rider on an elephant, and the rider is the conscious reasoning part, the elephant is the other 99% of what our mind is doing at any moment which is pattern matching, intuition, emotion, all the stuff that happens outside of our direct awareness. And uh, this metaphor seems to be very sticky. That is, a lot of people, uh, you know, like especially psychotherapists or just lots of people, if you ever tried to change yourself, if you've ever made New Year's resolutions, uh, you know, oh, I'm going to stop and smell the flowers this year, I'm going to be nicer to my wife, I'm going to exercise, you know, whatever. If you made those resolutions and then by February you haven't honored a single one, that's because it's your rider who made the resolution, and the rider is not in charge. So that's basically David Hume. That's what I showed you. I did show you that slide mm -hmm. of reasoning as the servant. So if you think about it this way, then we're all engaged here in a process of change. We're trying to figure out how to change our country, how to change other people, and how to change ourselves. And if it's a self-change problem, then the rider and the elephant are really relevant. Uh, you can try to change the rider, but that's easy and doesn't do very much. Or you can change the elephant which is harder to do but has more lasting effects, or you can change the environment, the path that the rider and elephant are on, which are going to make them do certain things differently. And so, uh, you know, I think we need to work on all three, but, um, you know, changing various, you know, basically changing the path in Washington will get different behavior from those guys without even having to change their elephants. But of course, you know, getting them to, to spend more time with each other, to, to like each other, to have relationships, that's going to change their elephants as well. So it's a, it's a way of thinking about the mind that explains why it's so hard to change. You, you said that the writer and reason can act almost like a PR person for the elephant. And I wonder if other, um, some liberals don't like your book because it gives them some PR material for their own sort of leaning to the, the elephant leans to the right in some ways because they love conservatives. They have conservatives in their life that they would like to not just tolerate, but respect. 
and revere. And your book gives them an ability, sort of teaches you know the writer how to how to justify the elephant leaning that direction. You have a very optimistic view of how people relate to those who are different from them. If you think that really liberals are just desperate to find a way to respect those conservatives in their life, I don't see a lot of evidence of that. What I the reception that I get on the left tends to be. You know, uh, you know, Haidt is kind of critical of liberals and liberals, you've all got to read this because he shows us how we can do better at manipulating people and winning elections. Mm. So, and that's, that's more, a more common reaction. I, I had once had lost a friend because I mentioned that I didn't think Jeb Bush was such a bad guy and it would have been helpful. At, Traitor. Yeah. It would have been helpful to have the, uh, the PR from your book at that moment. So I, before we turn it over, I, I there was, this has probably been said, but for me in reading this, it was sort of like the the political Myers-Briggs test. It was a chance to understand people that I worked with when I, when I thought through the moral foundations. And I said, you know, and I took his test. By the way, go take his test. Go to yourmorals.org, right? Yourmorals.org. It's real simple. And it's really fun to see where you are, you know, on this list of, of the six moral foundations. And... Um, I won't tell you, but, uh, but, you know, and then to realize that your colleagues that you work with, uh, depending sort of where they fit in the, on the, uh, continuum, feel very strongly about things you might not feel so very strongly about. And that's really helpful in understanding motivation and understanding working with other people and understanding, uh, how to have a more productive dialogue. I know that sounds really mushy, but the the point was it was really helpful in un, in self understanding and in others. And I guess there's a question in here along the lines of can people? Say, we did this the other night. Steve and Liz and I did this the other night because we come from very different perspectives, and we started talking about well, that's really your elephant talking, and that's no, you know, and well, I'm not going to try to convince you of my theory here, but there was a um, there was an um, emotional attachment and a respect and a personal sort of thing is. Is it really as simple as maybe we just sort of stop talking about the the really difficult issues that divide us and really sit down and try to develop develop emotional intelligence? Is that really where we ought to be spending our time? Well, it's very difficult to develop emotional intelligence. I think the fact that you three are collaborators, you're working together to make uh, to make Village Square successful, to put on events, and this is one of the most important principles: superordinate goals. So there's some classic research that one of the most classic studies in psychology, the uh, uh, Robbers Cave study, Muzaffar Sharif brought 20 uh, 11-year-old boys into the woods, divided them up into two camps. They didn't even know about each other. They just they have two camps of boys. Uh, and when they discovered each other, um, they got all competitive. And at one point, he brought them together to have lunch together to see what, what will happen if you bring them together just to be together. And of course, they threw food at each other and they hid each other. And so he did a variety of things. Just bring them together makes things worse. But then he he created this fake emergency that the uh, the water line broke, and uh, well, there's a water truck at the bottom of the hill that can get us water, but it's really it, it, it broke down, and we have to if we all work together, we can push it up the hill, and you know so it's a fake emergency, but they all have to work together, uh, and then he had a couple more things like that, and after just a couple of days of that, they they loved each other, they chose to ride home on the bus together, they, they buried the hatchet, and so this is the nature of of our, of our species. There's this great Arab proverb. Uh, uh, me against my brother, me and my brother against our cousin, me, my brother and cousin against the stranger. So it's not that you guys are working together to defeat somebody, but you've got a common purpose. You're working together, your teammates. Uh, so if you just bring people together just to talk, I don't think that's going to do a lot. Uh, but if I think Liz had a quote, and there was an article in the local paper, Liz had a quote, like we're building our, was it the Village Square tribe or the Tallahassee tribe? What was it? Um, I can't remember. But, but yeah, <laughs> That's but, my quote. <laughs> yeah. But at any rate, the point is, if you, if, if you bring people together to do something, then, not right away, but after doing something, then you can talk politics. Because then you are, you're now partners, you're collaborators. Steve, let's get to the questions. There's some great ones. Yeah, yeah. There, this one, um, I have a son and daughter-in-law that are really Republican. I have a daughter and son-in-law that are really Democrat. I have another daughter and son-in-law that are really Republican. And my husband and I see some good and bad coming from both sides. I'm finding it increasingly hard to find the truth, and I am mostly confused with the information we receive. What to do? Uh, well, um, first, uh, that sounds like a very rational response to a confusing situation, and that's a step forward if you're confused about the truth. The truth is very, very confusing. Mm. And it's very, very easy uh, to figure out what's right, but it's hard to be right about your conclusion about what's right. So, um, I'm sorry, that was a convoluted way of saying... <laughs> 
uh, that probably because you love these people, that has helped you to actually take them seriously rather than just, you know, if it was somebody else, somebody else's kid, you just think that you just write them off as, as being deluded or racist or, you know, or crazy, liberal, whatever, you, you, you find some way to write them off. If there is conflict within your family, my advice would be buy them all a copy of my book and pay them for reading it. That's what, um, that's what one, one gentleman in, North, in uh, New Orleans did. He paid each of his children and, and children-in-law $1,000 each to read, to read the book. Uh, so, that's, uh, so I'm not sure if that's particularly constructive advice, but um, what to do. <laughs> yeah, my my folks will give you a discount for family orders. Um, first of all, recognize that it is extremely hard to change anybody. So if your goal is to change people, that's very tough to do. It's hard enough to change yourself. And you have probably have a lifetime of trying to change your kids and probably weren't very successful at that. If your goal is to improve relationships, that you can do. So at the, I'd love to be a fly on the wall at Thanksgiving. Uh, but my guess is you can, you can definitely improve how things go at, at Thanksgiving when people get together. And, um, so they're all kinds. So what, assign it, have everybody, uh, email everybody, tell them to go to yourmorals.org, take their, uh, get, take the moral foundations questionnaire, print it out before you come to dinner. Now let's talk about it. Isn't that, you know, and you can say, oh, so you're really high on loyalty. Well, that explains why you always, you know, you want to be a boy scout and all, you know, you, you know, if you, if you have these analytical tools and this language for talking about it, it, it can be more of a fun exercise. That's what I really wanted to get across in the book is that actually talking about morality is really fun if you can get past the hate. Mm. I've got a question here. Uh, could you comment on the connection, if any, between the shift in, in academia, the focus in academia from the humanities to the empirical sciences and, and the social shifts that you described? Is there any connection as to what people are learning? Well, so each academic discipline is a moral community, and it has certain values, and hopefully each field has, has good academic values and values the truth. But what happens is some of the fields have gotten very activist. This happened especially uh, the gener the baby boomers uh, went through the 60s. When they entered graduate school in the 70s, many of them went in to fight racism or to, or to fight sexism or to, to basically pursue a political agenda. And uh, so what happened as the greatest generation of professors retired in the 90s, uh, some of them were conservative, some of them were Republicans. They were replaced by baby boomers, none of whom are Republicans, none of whom are conservative. So all of the academic, all the humanities and social sciences, except for economics, they're all getting purified. Uh, I'm a social psychologist. There is one known conservative social psychologist. His name is Rick McCauley at Bryn Mawr. He's a friend of mine. That's it. Nobody's found another. Um, and that's a real problem. So uh, the humanities, I think, are much, much worse. Uh, the humanity, many of the humanities are just blatantly political. Uh, so as every aspect of our society is getting more polarized, unfortunately, that's happened to the academy as well. And I think it's damaged scholarship in some fields. A lot of people refuse to believe, believe that you're really a centrist, right? I mean, they say that you're really a liberal in centrist clothing. I guess I, a question I would have is, you know, is there a particular individual freedom, for instance, that you'd be willing to give up because of your move to, to centrism? Particular individual freedom. Um, yeah, so one example would be this. So one of the big change, one of the reasons I changed was from reading uh, a lot of Emil Durkheim, the sociologist, and from thinking a lot about arguments about social capital and the importance of trust and the importance of having shared values and something that binds us together. And back when I was a secular liberal, I'm, I'm Jewish, but I was always very liberal and very anti-religion. You know, I, growing up Jewish in a Christian country, I'd be offended by, you know, Christmas trees in public places and things like that. <laughs> or, you know, I would be really angry if there was a moment of silent prayer. Or there, I never experienced that, but, you know, that's the sort of thing I'd be very against. But now that I, now that I um, see that conservatives, that many conservative and religious um, policies are designed to create a stronger moral community that helps suppress self-interest and bind people together in ways they can trust each other, I, I, I think that I would be willing to give up my freedom as an atheist to never be exposed to religion. That is, you know, while I wouldn't want a crucifix in a courthouse, but, you know, having the Ten Commandments, I mean, that's relevant. That's really relevant. I mean, I, I you know, uh, there's actually research showing that if you have people just name as many of the Ten Commandments as they can, and then they take a test, they cheat less. I mean, it actually works, you know? So, so I'm much more open to symbols of religion, to even a moment of silent prayer. I wouldn't want my kids forced to say a prayer to Jesus Christ, or to, you know, but, 
But a moment of silent prayer, you know, rituals, especially civic rituals, the Pledge of Allegiance, I wouldn't want anybody forced to say the Pledge of Allegiance, but I think having the kids stand up and say the Pledge of Allegiance is a good idea. So, you know, a lot of these ideas were really uh, thought of as horrible as fascism by people on the left for a long time. But I've changed on that. I, I think we do need we do need more ritual, more things to bind us together. As long as they're not coercive, as long as people can opt out. Thanks. If you have a um, question in the audience, just sort of get our attention just a little bit. Okay, I'll walk my way over to you while okay. I'm asking a question. Okay, well, um, especially I want to encourage, especially encourage the students who are here. The uh, there's some high school students, some college students. So if any students uh, want to ask a question, please hold your hand up, and Liz will, will come to you. Lots of people have just stopped talking politics. Good or bad idea? Well, if talking politics means just sort of bringing it up um, and then getting into an argument or debating somebody on the internet, which is the worst possible place to talk politics because there's anonymity, there's no relationship. Um, you know, I suppose that's a good idea as, for them as individuals. You know, what, of course, we would all like to have an engaged citizenry that knows the issues. I guess what I'd have to say is in the current environment, I can't blame people for stopping talking politics. Uh, but I'm hopeful, again, if we focus on indirect methods, that we can create more environments for people in which talking about politics will be fun, revealing, exciting, uh, give you that feeling of a special connection with someone that you never expected to connect to. So uh, the internet usually goes the reverse on that, but face-to-face -face connections. So you know, so I guess let's try to create more situations in which it's it's enjoyable and safe to do that. Let's have a village square in every town. All right, here, here. Hi. Uh, I'm a philosophy student, and um, uh, so for that reason, you might think uh, it's more likely that I would want the the power of reason to be part of resolving our differences. So, but uh, a bit of productive disagreement might say that look, harm is. Uh, I'm also a liberal, by the way. <laughs> harm is the the central moral phenomenon. Um, these other foundations you talk about, in group authority, purity. They're heuristics for reducing harms between people. So marital fidelity, for example, might be an important virtue. Why? Uh, because it prevents spouses from harming each other. Right. That's a very common argument I get on the left, which is our two foundations are the real ones. Mm -hmm. And the conservative foundations, those are just ways of realizing our foundations. I hear that a lot. And there's a sense in which it's true. But here's how it goes. Do you really believe that everything we do, that all policy should be related to reducing harm? Would you broaden it a bit and say, actually, it's increasing welfare? What do you think? Is it just about not harming? Or is, do we actually want a flourishing, happy society with engaged citizens who trust each other and can collaborate? Well, okay, part of flourishing is reducing harm. So uh, Peter Singer and other utilitarian philosophers focus a lot on reducing harm, and that's an important goal. But what Part of what really moved me over away from liberalism was reading, and I described this in the book, this is the scene that we were talking about. Uh, I came across a book when I was first teaching, going to teach a course on political psychology. I found a book on a bookshelf in a bookstore, said conservatism, pulled it off the shelf, started reading the introduction. And the author, Jerry Muller, laid out a series of conservative assumptions and arguments um, and said, what unites them is that this is a view about how to create a flourishing human society. I said, whoa. I always thought that's what liberals wanted. Conservatives want to suppress women's rights and have everyone bow down to God. And as a social scientist, I had to realize that there was, he was really onto something when he said things like, it is valuable to have some institutions that people respect, even if they don't understand. Um, as opposed to the liberal view is, if there's an institution, we should question it or knock it down unless we can specifically justify it. You know, so there's a, a real skepticism on the left about anything done in the past. It has to prove itself every year. Whereas the conservative mindset is, if it's been around a long time, uh, there's a quote from um, Edmund Burke, we should, something like, we should operate on our institutions as we would operate on our father, as we would do surgery on our father. You might have to do it, but you better be darn careful. And, uh, you know, so, I th so basically, if you want to create a good society in which people treat each other well... I don't think fully liberal assumptions are going to get you there. You need, you need to understand the importance of institutions, the importance of binding people in and not having everyone express themselves all the time. Uh, you need some conservative insights. That's why the view that I've come to is really much more yin-yang. There's a force for progress and change. You need that. And liberals have lots of great victories on those fronts. But you also need some people saying, slow down, be careful, don't knock everything down. 
uh, sometimes there are things you don't understand. And liberals tend to be very hubristic. They tend to think they can just do social planning and engineering, and they have a miserable record at it over the last hundred years. I'm probably more of a Gen X. Well, I am Gen X, Gen Y, or I'm 31, wherever that falls. And it seems to me that there's sort of baby boomers, and then there's the young people, mm-hmm. you know, and they're they're the ones that got, you know came out, uh, you know, in support of President Obama in 2008. And there's a really large you know, gap between, you know, being 18 and being 65. And so there are these other generations, and I'm just curious about trends or thoughts about polarization when it comes to people who are in their 40s or their 30s like I am, because, you know, we're the ones kind of entering into those next leadership positions and so on. Can can I piggyback on that real quick and just get your reaction in that context to Winston, I think it was Winston Churchill who once said, if someone is 20 and not a liberal, he has no heart. Mm-hmm. If he is 40 and not a conservative, he has no head that's or right. has no mind. Yeah, so give me right. a sense as well on all that. Yes. No, so um, so first on the generational question, uh, yes, I think things are going to change and we don't know how. So if, if it's true that uh, a person's worldview is shaped by how they saw the world when they were in their 20s, I think we can predict that the baby boomers was a very special generation uh, that faced, you know, they came out during Vietnam and legal racial discrimination and the civil rights struggle. They were, you can say, uh, they were, you know, you, marked by that for life. And their, that generation will pass. So I think we can predict that the next generation will not be as moralistic, not be as Manichaean, that is, good versus evil all the time. Now, the, 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 the your generation is sometimes criticized uh, because you guys, in a sense, go the opposite direction. For you, one of the mantras is, well, who am I to judge? I don't want to impose my values on anybody. You guys were raised with multiculturalism. And David Brooks has written brilliantly on how dangerous this is when you guys are afraid to make any moral judgments. And, you know, like one study asked people your generation to talk about moral dilemmas, moral problems, and they really had no clue what that meant. They would say things, well, I was trying to decide whether I should drive or take the subway someplace. They had no clue what it meant. Uh, Now, that could be a good thing, actually coming after the baby boom being so self-righteous. Uh, my guess is that as that it, it's easy to be hyper-tolerant. That's actually your morality. You really are actually quite judgmental about tolerance. Um, and that's fine when you're in college and you're forced into diversity programs constantly. And the big challenge is how do we all get along even though we're so diverse? But a lot of you guys are going to go on and become parents. And one thing you learn very, very quickly as a parent is that if you just try to reduce harm and be nice... You have a spoiled brat who never does what he's supposed to. Whereas the instant you make punishment reliably happen upon bad behavior, bang, it disappears within a day. So that makes you more conservative. You realize, actually, you know what? We do actually need punishment sometimes. And then many of you will go on and run businesses. And you're going to discover uh, that you need to be an authority sometimes. You can't be everybody's friend all the time. So to answer to answer Bill's question, um, I think there is that general progression. It's not necessarily just aging that makes people more conservative. It's growing into positions of responsibility. When you have to run something, you're responsible for others. And sometimes some conservative values can actually help you do that. So I think the next generation will change. I don't know how, but I am actually hopeful. I think that is one of the signs for hope, that this righteousness, this incredible self-righteousness might be just a temporary insanity. Uh, John, riffing off of that um, question, another audience question, the left is often criticized for valuing tolerance. Is tolerance also a moral value for the right? Um, Well, tolerance, so, you know, I thought about whether there's like a tolerance foundation, um, and I don't think there is. Uh, It's not clear evolutionarily why our ancestors who were tolerant went on to outbreed those who were intolerant. So it's not that we evolved to be tolerant. A dictum that I use is follow the sacredness. If you know what a group holds sacred, what are they circling around? Then you can understand so much of the strange things that they do. And for the left, I believe, and I say it in the book, you know, the central moral icon was the civil rights struggle. It was it was racism and black victimhood. And so uh, that whole generation is totally focused on protecting black people and then Hispanics and women and gay, now gay people and the handicapped. So it's, it's very much focused on victims and protecting victims. So tolerance isn't really, you know, everybody can do anything they want. Tolerance is really, we have to all be really, really careful about these seven classes of victims. Is the right like that? No way, not at all. So no, I don't think that tolerance is, is a virtue on the right as it is. But what I have noticed 
is that when I speak in liberal settings, there are zero conservatives, almost always zero. When I speak in conservative settings, it's usually majority conservative, but it's much more diverse. So I think that the conservatives that I've met, the conservative organizations I've had contact with, I find to be extraordinarily open-minded. Now, I haven't been you know, going to the religious right meetings. I haven't been going to groups in the far right. Um, but I do find that there's a large group of conservative intellectuals who are incredibly open and tolerant, more so than the left. I wonder if you would comment on the fact that we seem to have uh, an absence of the center right and the center left in this country. And when we talk about liberals and conservatives, it's almost as if we're talking about the ultra right and the ultra left, yeah. but there's a center. Yeah. And, and it seems to me that we, we lack that in this country. Mm -hmm. No, I think that's a very good observation. I don't know what the actual polling numbers are. I, it, wait, put it this way. It is true that uh, both, uh, both on both sides, people have gotten more extreme. The number of self-declared centrists is down. So both parties are shifting to the extremes. Um, what has happened to the Republicans uh, is that the voice, the leadership, the voice has gravitated much more to the, to the extreme than has happened on the left. Each party has gone through its period of moralistic insanity. Um, the left did that because of the 60s. The left went through that in the 70, you know, 60s and 70s. And the McGovern period, that was their period of going too far. Um, they got deep into identity politics, which deeply alienated most Americans and really, I think, took the party into electoral oblivion in the 70s and 80s. And then Bill Clinton pulled them back to sanity. And he, you know, he, he, he said, we need to be more centrist. So the Democrats had their craziness, their moral craziness, and then they pulled back. The Republicans didn't have that until recently. They're going through it now. So there are a lot of center-right folks out there, but they say, as one person who was in this room, I won't name names, said, when did my party become the stupid party? There are Republicans out there who, but there are center-right Republicans who are shocked and horrified as to what's happening. David Frum is a well-known center-right person who's, who's been written, writing on this, like, what happened to my party? They're going crazy. And again, that's follow the sacredness. They are in a deep moralistic circle around the founding fathers, no taxes, limited government. That's what they're doing now. And so it seems that's all we see is the far right, not the center right. So, so this notion of the yin and yang world um, that, that you lay out, that we, we need both sides, we need liberals, we need conservatives, that's, you know, that's, you know, it seems obvious, but that's a pretty radical point of view right now. You don't hear that a lot, you know, the idea that it really takes both. Mm -hmm. But do you feel like there's a tension between that way of looking at the world and then what you've, what you've talked about is, as our natural tendency to sacralize ideas and then revolve around them and build the heat and build the fire, mm -hmm. the, the power that we get from the fight? So, you know, when I think of the yin and yang world, I'm really drawn yeah. to that, but then I'm immediately bored. You know, it's like, well, you know, yeah. where are we going to get the passion? And I just that's wonder, true. you know, yeah. what you think. That's about true. That. So, um, you have to look at what each group is organized to do. So, if you're the U.S. Marines, what you value is not the truth, it's cohesion. You need, you really need a really intense initiation rights, boot camp, shared ideology. Your goal is cohesion. But in the sciences, your goal is truth. And what I'm arguing against is that, you know, so my field, social psychology, has become too ideologically pure that it blinds us to the truth. Uh, so there are times when it is useful to use morality or rev up the team to fight. And political parties, of course, have always done that. That's what they need to do. Unfortunately, they, they, once the parties became pure ideologically, as I showed in the talk, once it became not a coalition of interest groups, but all the people who shared one moral view, now, revving them up automatically leads to demonization. So uh, that does make the parties more effective, uh, and there's a kind of an arms race, and uh, whichever party tamps it down first uh, will be at a disadvantage. And so one thing people have said to me is, well, you know, if it's mostly liberals reading your book, and suppose liberals take your advice, and they lose their passion, they get less angry, you know, aren't they going to lose? And, and my response is, well, in the short run, that might happen. But my view is that since the Republicans figured out what they stand for and they reformed themselves in the 70s, they really changed in the 70s, the Democrats haven't done that. They don't know what they stand for. Um, and so something's going to have to happen in a big way to the Democratic Party for them to step back, step back away from, the, I think, the baby boomer 1960s morality and think about what it means to be a liberal in the 21st century. In the short run, I think uh, that might hurt the Democrats, but I think it'll open up the possibility for them to succeed in the long run. I've got one last audience question, and then we need to move forward. I'm amused by the 
popularity polls, likability polls, and uh, your your take on celebrity of these public figures, particularly politicians. I happen to work for Jack Welch at General Electric Company for many years. Nobody liked Jack Welch. Nobody. But he had impeccable integrity, was always focused, and was very decisive. And he never ran a popularity contest. Um, that's a good question. I, um that would be really more a question for political scientists as to what you know what leads to better government governance, uh, what leads to better leadership. I know in the corporate world, there's research showing that charismatic leaders are not better. They don't produce better outcomes in the long run than nuts and bolts, get it done, competent leaders. The few politicians that I've met, the few you know high level politicians that I've met, are are incredibly warm, likable, socially skilled people. I think that politics should be the art of compromise. And uh, you know, our political system does reward people who have very, very good interpersonal skills, and they're often more charismatic. There are some narcissists, there are some people who are deeply morally flawed. Um, but I, I can't really comment on it. I don't know that we've shifted more towards a celebrity political culture compared to years ago. I just don't know. I would guess television. I've heard it said that uh, uh, Washington is Hollywood for ugly people, um, and that might be changing now that now that you know television. You know, over the decades, visual uh, the visual element gets more and more important. So attractive people have more have more of an advantage. So the media might be changing things. I don't know whether that's good or bad. Uh, so I'm, I'm sorry. I just I can't really give you an answer. Sorry about that. Right. Okay. Last yeah. comments. We're about to wrap it up now. Steve, go ahead. I would just say I appreciate your clarity and your bravery. That's it. Yeah, yeah. I agree with that. Ladies and gentlemen, Jonathan. Thank you, thank you everyone. Right. And thank you, Liz and Village Square, for putting on this wonderful evening and this great food. Thank you. Hey there, it's Vanessa again. Let's hear it for Dr. Jonathan Haidt and his incredible work that helps us all to understand each other better. And it seems these points are perhaps even more relevant today. Liz speaks to that in the beginning of part one, the previous episode, when she talks about how John saw this coming. One other thing I noticed from this episode the part about race and about people on the left who have been focused on civil rights and protecting black people. This was interesting to me, given what we're living through now. And at first, it felt like sort of a contradiction to the current narrative about the role of white people in maintaining systemic racism. So I've been thinking about this. And I realized, I think this is another case of how two things that might seem contradictory can be true at the same time. It can be true that civil rights issues are of the utmost importance and we feel like we've been helping and we've been active, while at the same time, maybe we weren't actually doing the right things or enough of the right things, maybe because we didn't fully understand the big picture and our role in it. I think this also speaks to the elephant and the rider analogy, how our awareness has major limits and how the elephant is really in control. It was very helpful for me to consider this more high level and long view of the situation and to think about what we're wrestling with now in the context of John's work. All right, before we close out, I'd like to share one more quick little piece of last week's chat with Liz. Here she is talking about the blind spots that we all have and the need to be able to talk with people who feel differently than us. In some ways that having different people to see into our blind spots is the basis of so many of our successful institutions in society. The the academy, um, peer review of academic art, art articles there. I mean, they're supposed to go in there and really kind of beat you up, right? Because they're looking for blind spots because they're seeking what is really true. Um, the jury system, same idea that, that somehow out of all those different bias perspectives and people using confirmation bias, that you're going to be able to find the truth by um, seeing into each other's blind spots and bringing them up together. So the problem is that we're, we don't form groups like that anymore. We only hang out with the people who have our same blind spots. So, so I think that's a, like a really important thing to understand about where we are because and then what we see over and over again over the years is is just that 
if you do really get people together in this sort of team sport of reasoning and they really do see things differently, amazing things happen. And it feels, uh, after all these years of doing this, if I, if I go into a room of all people who see politics exactly the same way as I do, it feels very flat and it feels like, feels like we're never going to get anywhere. And so I, I far prefer the conversations that include people who disagree with me. Okay, you guys, I think that's the perfect note to end this episode on. Please subscribe to the Village Squarecast in your favorite podcast app or on our website at villagesquare.us slash squarecast. You can find the show notes page for this episode with links to resources mentioned at villagesquare.us slash squarecast. You can also subscribe to our newsletter to keep up to date with all of Village Square's activities at villagesquare.us. We appreciate you listening to The Righteous Mind with Dr. Jonathan Haidt. Until next time, we challenge you to reach out with an open heart and mind to someone who doesn't look or think like you. It changes everything. We'll talk to you soon, and thank you so much for listening to The Village Squarecast.